Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The texts for the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost are as follows. However, if you are looking for the Reformation podcast, that is also available for this Sunday and as a separate podcast with separate texts. But this podcast is for the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost which falls on October 29, 2023. And the texts are Leviticus 19, 1 through 2 and 15 through 18. Our alternate first reading is Deuteronomy 34, 1 through 12, Psalm 1. Our second reading is 1 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 8. And then the gospel reading, Matthew chapter 22, 34 through 46. And Last week on the podcast, we talked a lot about testing and trial and that uh, that connection back to Jesus' own testing in the wilderness. And here we have another moment of testing with the question of what is the greatest instruction? What is the what is which commandment in the in the instruction in the Torah of God is is the greatest? So that's the that's the test du jour. <laughs> wow! <laughs> Can I just say too? I think these texts are also great for Reformation Day. True. We'll come back to that. But these are oh. texts that can also fit uh, oh. if you uh, are marking Reformation Day in some way. I I, I think I think you're right. Yeah. yeah. Although then we wouldn't get to talk about John. So there's that. <laughs> and we Candle. got commercial right in early. Candle. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. Ooh. Well done. Well done. <laughs> I do. I do like the clarity um, that is uh, that is recorded in this transition here. The Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees. And so they got together. Uh, it's um, it's the rumors about Jesus. The the things that people were talking about Jesus are like it, it's like he, his life has become a reality show. Like like Truman, if you remember that. Um, it's not just of course you're going to hear he fed five thousand, or of course you're going to hear he you know. Um, um, uh, gave sight to the blind. Um, uh, of course, you're going to hear he got some folks upset in in the the um, um, lawgivers. But now it's like, oh man, did you hear the answer that he gave them? How are we going to get a get our get our questions asked in a way that puts us keeps us on top? We need to talk about this. So it's it's. Um, you kind of mentioned this uh, last week, Caroline. This is a, a organized, um, strategic move. If, if you know that this isn't a random, um, oh Jesus is here. Let, let me just say something. This is intentional. They're they're going after him. They are, and and his answer is really interesting. If they're going after him, because. Um, because this isn't, there's no woe to you or something like that. But I think his, his answer is basically, I'm one of you. Yes. Um, and Nick Chaser in the commentary pulls this out really well, I think. But it's, it's, I, I believe what you believe. And so if you're out to get me, just know that Yeah. Uh, what you don't like about me <laughs> is more complicated than you might be willing to admit because I'm one of you. I, he's, you know. I am Jewish to the core. I participate fully in, in Judaism. Uh, we debate the same teachings, but when it comes down to what really matters, this is what I believe. I think that's true for both paragraphs here. And so that's that right. also makes it really complicated, which is why I think it's interesting for Reformation Day. It's this reminder that whatever we see about Jesus that's reforming isn't just a Catholic Protestant thing. It isn't Catholic Orthodox split. It's not going back to the first century. It's It comes out of the the I want to say the disputatious. That's not the, quite, quite the right word, but the debates and the interpretive acts around the law that have been going on um, way prior to Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is what it means to be um, the people of God. 
um, who carry out our end of the um, conditional covenant. Um, Learn these commandments and obey. And here Jesus says, what do they look like? Well, they look like loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. And if we attend to what um, uh, upset God that the prophets uh, attested to that landed Israel uh, in 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 exile, um, which allowed uh, when God allowed their enemies to have victory over them, it was always their practices or lack of worshiping God the way God had required to be worshipped or serving God the way God had required to be served. I'm going back again to these Ten Commandments, um, which that call out, um, Moses uh, say to Pharaoh, let my people go, could either be translated that they may worship me, that same word, or they may serve me. And then when they get out into the wilderness, how, how is it that God says serve him? How is it that God says worship him? And it is not a 59-minute once-a-week gathering. It is loving God and loving your neighbor in a just way. And that's problematic. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, it's an answer, you know, to this, to this question that, uh, I mean, it, I, I wonder how, if a preacher could kind of, if, if you had to choose, you know, what, what is, by what commandment do you, you know, do you live? Uh, and, um, and what does it mean to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind? And I think one of the things that would be helpful to hear is to especially as we're getting closer to to the end of of Matthew and then the end of year A to remind the preachers and then the preachers remind their listeners that how has Jesus embodied that commandment mm -hmm. in in his ministry in Matthew what what is what does it look like for Jesus to love the love God with all of his heart and all of his soul and with all of his mind and then how is he asking us to do that? And you, your comment made me think too, Joy, of, you know, again, going back to the Beatitudes, that it's that loving God with all your heart is this hungering and thirst for righteousness and uh, and that, that the righteousness extended to the neighbor. And so uh, I, I think to rather than to have that comment commandment be kind of abstract i think it could be really abstract and generalized uh oh yeah that's one of the command one of the 10 commandments or, or uh but but how how has it been played out how has it been embodied in jesus ministry and then that's that's what we are called to do as well so it how can we put some flesh <laughs> on on what that what that actually looks like i think would be helpful for people to to think about what's at stake with this commandment. It's, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, and that's part of what, that's part of what is at issue with Jesus as well. And these, in these last conflict scenes or debates with authorities is that you might love God with all your heart, but how is that getting at, how, what are the fruits of that? What, yes. are, what are the, what are the results of that love? Where do we see that manifested? And, and if there is not a correlation between loving God and, and doing God's righteousness in your, and your works and your, and your fruit bearing fruit, then there's something wrong there. Uh, if there's not a direct line between that so that's uh, that for me is a very much worthy of a sermon. <laughs> yeah. Next, I don't know if you want to jump in, Matt. I'm going to say something that may be controversial, um, and maybe I'm doing that on purpose. But um, I'm, I'll get I, out of your way then. <laughs> <laughs> I I want to say I I I said that. Um living out the commandments to to uh, use the words that Caroline 
placed in my imagination. Um, it's difficult, the expectation that it would not just be an idea or something that we would hang on our wall, but that, it, as Caroline said, it would actually be something that we live out. That's a problem. So this literary move, which is actually what they did, but it, it, it be, can become a, a way of reading what uh, happens next in, in in Matthew is, okay, let's ignore that question. Anything that Caroline just said about living this out and the fruit that we're bearing, let's just ignore that altogether. And let's try to uh, wrestle with this question. Um, what do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? Let, let me quote some scripture and see what you can do with that Jesus. And as you reminded us last week, um, Matt, uh, that's probably not a good move. It didn't work in the original trim temptation. It's not going to work here. And it turns this portion of Matthew right on its edge because once again, they are silenced. Yeah. So I wouldn't play with the fighting. I dive in and actually ask the question that you lifted for us, Caroline. How are you living out this wonderful commandment that you say you believe? Or as you said, Matt, this is what it means to be um, uh, a Jew. And Jesus is embodying it perfectly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Well, and I think too that he's, um, this is one of the reasons they're going to kill him. That. Yes. Uh, not because he's clever, but they're going to kill him. Uh, and by they, I mean the Romans. But you know, this is why the this is why the hostility is going to accelerate. He's already given them a parable about how the uh, you know the people who who guard Israel, who guard the vineyard, have killed the son of the landowner and, and chucked his body outside the city. Uh, I don't know if that details in Matthew or not, but. He's already kind of made the claim that he's sent by God. That's actually that question of authority that we've been talking about. And so for him now to get into this exegetical debate about is the Messiah going to be greater than David or less than David, coming from his mouth at this point in the story, <clears throat> I think they understand fully well that this guy's making claims for himself that are a little too big. And so the charge with which they'll deliver him to Pilate, at least internally, is blasphemy. Mm -hmm. yeah. So... Yeah, there's something he's he's saying I'm one of you, but then he's also got this. Um, who do you think I am? You know, I mean, he's still he's still pushing that question on whose authority are you doing all of this? It's just a yeah. lot more yeah. subtle. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think too um, that I think too that the and we should probably go on, but I mean the Leviticus text is there because because Jesus is quoting it obviously but but that is an interesting connection too in a sermon on this passage that that you know the second reading is going to be uh or the first reading is going to be from Leviticus what that puts before people and what you see in what Jesus is doing is that when you when you put scripture before people when you take the act of interpreting scripture uh, it's not always going to be received with uh, open arms, and that the act of interpreting scripture is a risky is risky business. Yeah. Uh, and 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 that's in part what's behind all of this as well is what what scripture are how are you interpreting scripture? Uh, what scripture are you lifting up? Uh, and all of that has to do with has to do with who you think God is. Yes. And so to, to, to see this getting, getting done in, you know, in the ministry of Jesus is maybe it doesn't make for a sermon, but there, there might be something that the preacher could do with regard to, this is what we are called to do. We're called to, this is part of what it means of interpreting scripture and, and the way in scripture, the way scripture gets used uh, and particularly in our, you know, our common uh, parlance of, <laughs> of, of, you know, discussions or not, or lack thereof with regard to God's activity in the world. So, uh, but yeah, even when you interpret scripture, you're, you're going to, you're, there's going to be resistance in that. 
So, Caroline, I think that that's a great homiletical uh, move, and it's an appropriate one uh, for Reformation Sunday, because that is in some ways what the Reformation was about, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and uh, so I think I think you've given us a great one. Um, this is what the task is. This is partly why we gather week after week to hear this word that is um, an ancient text, but a living wisdom. And um, uh, th- these words from Leviticus, wow, man, they are they're difficult words if you focus on parts that we. We kind of miss, for example, if we're reading James, um, we sometimes miss that um, where the statement, it's the same statement in James, but you shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. This is, this is about justice. This is, this is about uh, an equal playing field for everyone. And that is so countercultural. Yeah. And you know, right now we might um, we might feel that what we're saying a lot of is um, we need to attend to the poor. But is that maybe not an interpretation of we should not defer to the great? If if it's stated positively rather than negatively. Might not they be saying the same thing? Not to defer to the great is to attend to the poor and um, to be partial to the poor. Well, that kind of automatically, uh, excuse me, to not be partial to the poor, uh, that kind of automatically does the opposite. I, I don't know. Reading this could get us in trouble, especially if we play on both sides of those requests. Um, and then leaving that um, kind of economic question, um, rendering an unjust judgment. I don't know what your news reads like or sounds like, but I know mine, not just in the United States, but around the world and not just in politics, but um, in, um, in our congregations, in our denominations, there is a question of whether or not the judgments that are being made are just. I'll stop there, but I just yeah. think this Leviticus text is rich. Yeah. Well, it's not, it, it is. It, 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 no, it really is. And then also, uh, this is where I would point our our listeners to the commentary too, mm-hmm. with regard to the discussion of and around the concept of holiness and what does that actually mean. And and going back to our our conversation of of how Jesus, you know, how Jesus himself has embodied this law, this instruction, and that, uh, and, and that we are called also to imitate God's holiness. What is that? We don't talk about that. I mean, I mean, very often I, you know, sanctification we talk about in certain denominations, uh, but the, uh, this idea of holiness, <laughs> um, what, Sorry. what, in certain denominations, well, I, let me just say this: not it's in mine. the Bible, you know, both testaments. <laughs> what? I said it's it in the Bible. It in both in the Bible. So this is more. This is just more Lutheran I'm, hazing going on here. People don't no, know what's no, happening. I'm, I'm pointing the finger at mine because okay. we, at my <laughs> but you're trying to weasel out of like the need to talk about sanctification. No. You'll never no. get that past Joy because she's a Methodist. That's I right. Know, exactly. <laughs> I'm very aware that that yeah if, if about uh, that Methodists and sanctification. I I yeah. love it, and actually I'm pointing. I'm sorry to interrupt. You you were you were making a point. <laughs> no, I was pointing the figure at my denomination. Who as soon as we start talking about sanctification, gets all you know, yeah. Um, they get the willies. They start freaking out. And so, which would make also for a really interesting Reformation service. <laughs> we could have the Lutherans talk about sanctification and holiness. <laughs> and I would feel like I have made a contribution. Oh, well, I'm all for it. So, but then again, I'm, you know, I'm a California Lutheran, which I've mentioned a lot of times. So I, this is where also I would bring in the Psalm, 
here, uh, and and particularly when we were when we were talking about the role of uh, the role of scripture and how that's one of our uh, that's one of our primary callings is to is to engage in scriptural interpretation and listen for how it's being interpreted, uh, and 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 yet and the and there is delight right in the instruction of the Lord and uh, and. And on the on the instruction on the law of, of the Lord, we meditate day and night, and so uh, that that the ways in which um, that instruction and that law um, and that scripture is uh, the way in which it um, it's like by by it's like being planted by streams of water. Um, so it's not, it's not an intellectual exercise. It's not an exegetical exercise, but that which leads to and becomes holiness in us. Mm. So that's, that's how I would bring in the psalm. And I, since I'm being a little edgy, um, one of the things that strikes me, uh, about this on the other side of that, um, the the line um, they're like a tree planted by streams, which uh, yield their fruit fruit in the season, and their leaves do not wither. Um, in all they do, they prosper. And then it moves on. It says the wicked are not so. And so what you have is the righteous, those that delight in the law, those who, to use our words, practice the holiness of God, imitate the holiness of God in their flesh, in their embodiment. Um, they stand. Um, a tree planted by streams of water has the nourishment and the deep roots, the roots to be yes. able to stand when the wind blows. Right. And then the wicked, when the wind blows, well, that wind is the judgment. And it says the wicked will not stand in the congregation of the righteous. It, there's this this acknowledgement for me that the wind that is blowing is simply a person that is practicing the love of God, that is um, giving just rulings, that is loving their neighbor, that is practicing holiness um, in a way that is recognizable, is an assault. Their goodness, their righteousness is an assault against the wicked, against those who um, are unjust against those who um, do not who uh, uh, do not follow God's will. I, I don't know why I'm saying this, but except that uh, I thought it. <laughs> but, okay, get it out. <laughs> no, we've said some things that actually we call a lot of Matthew. In the, I mean, Psalm yeah. one, I think, is resonant with the very end of the Sermon on the Mount and the two yeah. houses built mm -hmm. on sand and the rock. Yeah. We've talked about the holiness code in. In Leviticus, which is similar to where Jesus says, you know, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and fair, I mean, he's you'll know, be holy in the in chapter five, late second half of chapter five of the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. And so a lot of what we're doing, a lot of the ways we're talking here is also reaffirming not just Jesus's Jewishness, but Matthew's as well. And this idea of this testimony that's deeply wrapped in a very high regard for for yeah. Torah. Yeah. Not as letters on paper but as a disclosure of who God is and a God who desires to be known and God who desires to bless the world in ways. So I don't do this often where I try to relate different, many different texts uh, across the board for a sermon, but yeah, Joy's happy. He, like, I've been working <laughs> on you for years, Skinner. Um, <laughs> that's something I thought of in the moment, but. Yeah, no, yeah, no, it's good. Something to, to be noted, too, is that we do the reading, um, but the way that this is accounted for, uh, Moses taught on the mountain, Jesus taught on the mountain. Um, uh, we're about to turn to a, a letter that was written, but the way that this was actually uh, recognizable by the people was the accounts that were verbally given and the lives that were fruitfully living, lived that were dem that these were demonstrated in what in people's behavior and so we've got um dare i say on this sunday post reformation all of these written things and 
this is an opportunity to remind folks that this is not about reading the right thing. This is about living the right way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Which might bring us to this letter. Yeah, we have to do Deuteronomy too, right? Oh, 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 right, right. Yeah, we just skipped over the Leviticus and verse, and we just skipped over Moses dying. We skipped over. Yes, I'm sorry, Moses. Yeah, but it's funny the lectionary skips over basically Leviticus, Numbers, and almost all of Deuteronomy. But, um, (laughs) but this is the scene, right? I've been to the mountaintop. I mean, talk about a text that's got a an interesting afterlife as well. But yes, a climactic moment where it looks like the promise of land might finally be kept. Yeah, but he doesn't get to see that. Doesn't get to see. That. Oh, you're now it's what? Now you're making the story sad. <laughs> well, he sees it. He yes. doesn't get to experience it. Correct. Yes, that's a good distinction. That's an important distinction. Yes. He does not get to see it, but no. no. Well, that, he well, is told that doesn't that mean God, something? He, he he is told that God is God is going to be faithful. And that Joshua, who he knows, um, is going to keep on. Yeah. Doesn't that mean? Does that make the scene? This is an honest question. Does that make the scene sad then, or is there still something? See, I'm gonna I'm gonna get out of the emotion here and go to my head, and I'm gonna say this is a solid reminder that possibly these books weren't written by the hand of Moses. <laughs> well, I, I I'm with you there. I'm with but. you as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is it sad or not? I don't. I, I can give you, I can give you a not sad. Okay. I, I'm, I'm trying to remember um, how, how, how the commentary um, addresses this, but uh, one of the ways it's not sad is when um, your um, parents or grandparents have had a hope for you and they didn't see that hope. But you do. Um, And I say that with the echo, Matt, of your recognizing uh, or announcing that these words of Moses um, have an afterlife in the words of Martin Luther King, who himself had this hope, but did not see it. and, And yet in ways, in so many ways, it became a reality. Not yet complete, no more complete than the fullness of God's promise to Moses. We aren't in that completeness yet. Um, so there, there's good news is that, yeah, this generation may not see it, yeah. but they can hope. And this generation that sees it can say, um, it's sort of like when I was in Africa, uh, 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 well, almost a year ago now, um, I stood at the Atlantic at the point of no return and said, I'm standing here. I have returned and I am free. Thanks, Troy. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, That's a great story. I mean, comparison. Yeah. I told you to go to the letter. That's all I, that, yeah, I'm, I, yeah, I, that's great. Yeah. (laughs) That's why I went to the letter. Yeah. (laughs) Well, let's. Let's do it. Let's go to uh, second th- or first Thessalonians. first Thessalonians. Our second reading of five from mm-hmm. so we've mentioned last week from uh, Thessalonians, and you mentioned uh, something last week too, Matt, that I think is important to remember is that the first three chapters of Thessalonians are this uh, are in the context of Thanksgiving, right? That the that extended Thanksgiving that we have in in Thessalonians is significant in terms of, of how Paul structures his letters and, and with the, you know, the salutation, greeting, Thanksgiving, and then moving into the body. And uh, so to, again, to hear, hear this portion of chapter two within that context. So within that sort of rhetorical framework of, uh, for what is, for what is Paul thankful, not only, for of God, thankful uh, from God, thankful for the gospel of Jesus Christ, but also in the ministry of the of this particular congregation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And to echo what you set up last um, last week, uh, Caroline, the pastoral heart, 
mm-hmm. of 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 uh, of Paul here, um, yeah. where he he basically explains in verse three um, how he uh, how they have come to this community, um, the kind of leadership that they have exercised, not manipulative, mm-hmm. not arrogant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so it's, I, I think the instinct of a lot of preachers is to put ourselves in Paul's position and to say, well, this is what pastoral ministry looks like in terms of being genuine and nurturing and compassionate and gentle, which is of course true, but for the purposes of a sermon, I would think, how do you help people think this is the nature of Christian community? Like this is how we mm-hmm. engage with each other. So it doesn't become, you know, the pastor over and, but Yep. To see Paul in his own self, or I should say actually Paul and his co-workers, Silvanus mm-hmm. and Timothy, together as embodying this little community in and of themselves that's now trying to um, model the ways of Christ and the ways of, of the church into a different, or an expanded community. And so to help people think about, you know, where and how does that take place beyond just quote unquote niceness, you know, but th- this actual commitment to one another's well-being which these chapters affirm. Mm.